Early on in development, the embryo is a flat, disc-shaped organism made up of three layers of pluripotent cells called germ layers, which give rise to all the organs and tissues in the body. They have an inner layer, called the endoderm, a central layer, called the mesoderm, and an outer layer, called the ectoderm. By week four of development, the embryo takes on a more recognizably human form. But to be honest, it still looks more like a shrimp than a baby. At the head end of this little shrimp-like creature, a set of structures called the pharyngeal apparatus starts to develop, consisting of the pharyngeal arches, clefts, and pouches. The pharyngeal apparatus starts forming when six little bars of mesoderm, the pharyngeal arches, sprout from the primitive pharynx in the craniocaudal fashion, going from head to tail. These arches are paired, symmetrical bumps that form during weeks 4 and 5. The arches are numbered from 1 to 6, but the fifth either never forms or quickly regresses, so it actually doesn't develop into any structures. Between the fifth pharyngeal arches, four pharyngeal clefts form, and cover the external part of the arch with ectoderm cells, while four pharyngeal pouches line the internal part of the arch with endoderm. Now, the components of the pharyngeal apparatus develop into various head and neck structures, and sometimes multiple arches join together to give rise to a single structure. Each pharyngeal arch, with its associated pouch and cleft, carries its own cranial nerve that innervates the structures forming from that arch. The first pharyngeal arch is mainly associated with everything we need to chew. Structures from this arch are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, more specifically its mandibular branch. In terms of bones, it gives rise to the maxilla, which forms the upper jaw, and the mandible, which forms the lower jaw. Two small portions of the mandible give rise to the incus and the malleus bones of the middle ear, which resemble an anvil and a hammer and transmit sound vibrations from the eardrums. The first pharyngeal arch also forms part of the temporal bones, as well as the zygomatic bones or cheekbones. To help remember this, you might think of Ziggy Stardust, who has pretty striking cheekbones. Now, muscles that come from the first pharyngeal arch include muscles that help us chew, which are the temporalis, masseter, and pterygoid muscles, as well as a muscle that blocks out noises from chewing, the tensor tympani, and some of the muscles that help us swallow like the tensor villi palatini, the mylohyoid muscles, and the anterior belly of the digastric. The posterior belly of the digastric will actually be formed by the second arch. So right there is an example of pharyngeal arch teamwork. So the second pharyngeal arch forms structures that will be innervated by the facial nerve, and a lot of these structures take part in forming facial expressions. For the bones, we have the hyoid bone, specifically the lesser horns in the upper portion, as well as the styloid process of the temporal bone. The second arch also forms the stapes, which is the tiniest bone in the body which works with the malleus and incus to help transmit sound to the inner ear. Muscles from the second pharyngeal arch mainly control facial movement and expression. Some second arch muscles like the posterior belly of the digastric and the stylohyoid muscle also help with swallowing. Another muscle derived from this arch is the tiny stapedius muscle, which anchors the stapes of the ears. The third pharyngeal arch structures are innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. But there are actually only two structures, the rest of the hyoid bone and one muscle of the throat, the stylopharyngeus, that helps with swallowing. Now remember, because arch 5 doesn't form anything, our last pharyngeal arches are 4 and 6. And these are both innervated by branches of the vagus nerve. The superior laryngeal branch innervates fourth arch structures, and the recurrent laryngeal branch innervates sixth arch structures. The two arches don't form any bones, but they work together to form the laryngeal cartilages. Muscle-wise, the fourth pharyngeal arch gives rise to the levator palatini, which prevents food from entering the respiratory tract while we swallow, as well as the pharyngeal constrictors, which squeeze food down the esophagus. And both of these muscles are part of the mouth and pharynx. And finally, there's the cricothyroid muscle, which tenses the vocal cords to produce sound. The sixth arch gives rise to all the rest of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx that help us speak. 
So the cricothyroid of the fourth arch, as well as the sixth arch, helps form the muscles of the larynx. The tongue is a structure that takes three arches to form. The anterior two-thirds starts as a bud from the floor of the first arch. We can remember this because when we chew with structures formed by the first arch, we might end up biting the anterior portion of the tongue. The posterior one-third comes from buds of the third and fourth arches, and these arches form most of the structures in the pharynx, which is where the posterior portion of the tongue is. All right, to memorize the structures in the pharyngeal arches, we'll use five different characters at a circus to represent the five arches. Let's first imagine a little boy named Billy, happily chewing gum while visiting the circus. This is the first character, so arch one. And he's chewing gum, because muscles and bones of the jaw come from arch one. His name's also Billy, and it's on the front of his shirt, reminding us of the anterior belly of the digastric. His favorite game is the strength machine, which requires a giant hammer and a giant anvil at the bottom of the game, which represent the malleus and the incus, respectively. Billy tries to smash the anvil with the hammer, and his bubblegum pops which startles him so he tenses up, reminding us of the tensor tympani and the tensor villi pelatini. Next up, Billy meets a clown with a big frown. This second character is Arch 2 and his frown reminds us of muscles of facial expression. This clown's name is also Billy, but this time it's printed on the back of his shirt, reminding us of the posterior belly of the digastric. Billy the clown works part-time in the rodeo, and so his foot's still stuck in a stirrup, which reminds us of the stapes and stapedius muscle. And finally, Billy the clown's carrying a bunch of horseshoes, reminding us of the horseshoe-shaped hyoid bone, after Billy meets Billy the Clown, he heads over to the circus's main attraction, two giraffes, one with three spots and one with four spots, both with really long necks. Both of these remind us that arch three and arch four give rise to the pharynx. Also, the three-spotted giraffe likes to wear accessories, like horseshoes, reminding us that arch three also contributes to the horseshoe-shaped hyoid bone. Being a stylish giraffe, he also likes to wear a stylish scarf, representing the stylopharyngeus muscle. Meanwhile, the four-spotted giraffe is busy just eating leaves, reminding us that arch four gives rise to the muscles that help move food down the esophagus. <gasps> Suddenly, the four-spotted giraffe starts choking because something went down its air pipe. And that's because it has a problem with the levator palatini muscle that normally prevents food from going down the wrong tube. So it ends up with a cricket in its larynx which represents the cricothyroid muscles. Now, next up, the master of ceremonies that day is a six-year-old mime, who's very talented. That reminds us that arch six gives rise to the muscles in the larynx that produce sound. The exception is the cricket that's stuck in the four-spotted giraffe. That said, the mime does a surgery to remove the cricket. And then he puts a long, hard cast around the giraffe's neck, which represents the laryngeal cartilages, which come from both arches 4 and 6. Alright, so if we get back to the pharyngeal apparatus, separating the pharyngeal arches on the outside of the embryo are four pharyngeal clefts, which are layered with ectoderm cells. Clefts 2 to 4 fade as the embryo grows, while the first pharyngeal cleft works closely with the first pharyngeal pouch to form the ear. The cleft being on the outside gives rise to the external auditory meatus, or ear canal, and it also forms the eardrums. The first pharyngeal pouch, which is on the inside, gives rise to a long, thin cavity that expands to form the internal auditory meatus, or middle ear. A small portion of the cavity remains narrow, becoming the eustachian tube between the auditory canal and the nasopharynx. Cells lining the second pharyngeal pouch multiply and migrate to form the primitive tonsils. The third pouch and fourth pouch are very similar because they both divide into a dorsal and ventral portion. The dorsal portion of the third pouch becomes the inferior parathyroid gland, while the dorsal portion of the fourth pouch becomes the superior parathyroid gland. These glands create parathyroid hormones, which help increase calcium levels in the blood. The ventral portion of the third pouch becomes the primitive thymus, 
and will later descend down to the chest. The ventral portion of the fourth pouch becomes the ultimopharyngeal body, which is a pouch-like embryological structure that has cells which differentiate into parafollicular or C cells of the thyroid. C cells produce calcitonin, which acts to lower blood calcium. Now the thyroid gland itself develops from the endoderm at the base of the tongue, which is independent of the pharyngeal apparatus. And it'll descend down the neck and the parathyroid glands will latch onto it as it passes by, while cells from the ultimopharyngeal body will also migrate into the thyroid as it continues down to rest at the base of the neck. Alright, as a quick recap, the pharyngeal arches derive from the mesoderm, giving rise to many of the bones and muscles in the head and neck. The pharyngeal clefts derive from the ectoderm, forming structures in the ear canals. And the pharyngeal pouches arise from endoderm cells, and these form parts of the ears, as well as the early tonsils and many portions of the parathyroid and thyroid glands. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.